truly unfathomable, Lord, that you would love the likes of us. When we think about love and what it means that you, the infinitely glorious, perfect one, would love your enemies, finite creatures who have set our hearts against you, who by nature and by deeds do that which you find repulsive. And yet you extend your love to pitiable creatures. You loved us when we were at our worst. Such love we will never fathom. We will never plumb the depths of its beauty and its mystery. And yet this morning we join our voices to acknowledge your love, to thank you for your love, to praise you for your love. And even as we look at your word this morning, which highlights your initiating, infinite, glorious love for sinners, we pray that we would be transformed by it, compelled by it to live for you. And we ask for your help in this, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and as you're finding your way there, I want to give you just a couple of church planting updates. Uh, The first relates to what Eric prayed for a few moments ago. Uh, A team will be traveling to New Orleans this week, and uh, if you were headed to New Orleans as part of the field trip uh, investigative excursion, I'd love for you just to stand. So um, maybe not everybody's in the room, but Omri and Emily Miles are leading that trip, Nick and Brittany, uh, Matt and Janelle Schneider, Derek and Pam Robinson, Kyle and Ashley Frazee, Diana Allen, Rachel Hornack, Ryan and Christina Reed, and Donald and Shonda Taylor from California are all joining. Um, So you can pray for these. Not every name that I listed um, is planning to be a part of the core team, and not all of the core team is planning to go on this trip. You guys can be seated. Thank you. Um, But I want to encourage you just to pray for this team as they go. Um, Pray for safe travels. Pray for uh, good opportunities to see the city, uh, to look forward to and plan for what God may be pleased to do there. Pray that they have encouragement as a team and grow together in uh, not only their love, but their camaraderie around the needs of a city that is largely without the gospel. So... um, By the way, we're having Costco sheet cake in the lobby, and it is not for their departure. They're only gone for a week. Um, We're going to celebrate Costco sheet cake this uh, this morning after the service to uh, to commemorate Zach and Cassidy uh, going back to Papua New Guinea. So we'd love for you guys to come up front and uh, bring. Oh, you don't have you don't have your kiddos with you anymore, do you? Not even Annie. They sent them to NGM. Okay, so just stand up here, embarrassingly in front of the people that love you. And um, if you followed their emails this week, you know that the passports that were supposed to be here didn't make it here. They had flights scheduled for tomorrow. Those passports are supposed to get here, what, Tuesday? Um, So if they're here next week, well, they don't want to be here next week. They're really trying to leave uh, maybe Wednesday, maybe Friday, uh, the new flights. So you can pray for the details on that. Um, But they are going back to rejoin the Mitchells uh, their teammates there in Maiororo, uh, that village in the mountains of Papua New Guinea that has been uh, for so long without the Bible, without the gospel, without the local church. And, um, and if my math is right, Zach, I think you and your team are the only people in the world that know God's word and speak and write dough. And so um, that's a monumental task ahead of you, to put God's word in their language, to, to give them a written language, to teach them to read and write their own language, to preach the gospel to them, which you have done and will continue to do. Um, and, and Lord willing, um, God will produce a church there that will multiply. And we know that this is not, um, not a short trip, not an easy trip, but the fruit of a lot of training and a lot of labor yet ahead of you. So uh, we're going to take a few moments together and just pray for you and then... Um, and we're sad and happy. Lord, thank you so much for Zach and Cassidy and their sweet kids, for Jude and Oliver and Annie. We thank you for the Mitchells whom they will join. We thank you for others who labor both here uh, and there, uh, behind the scenes. I thank you for this body of believers here and other connected churches that labor in prayer. 
And God, we ask that you would do a work far beyond human ability, far beyond remarkable human accomplishment, but do the things that only you can do by the power of your spirit to bring people to yourself, to draw them in faith to Christ, the only Savior, to produce a church, to produce a church that will multiply and take the gospel beyond even that language and that people. And we pray all this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Cassidy. Well, if you're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are in our fourth week in this sort of apex chapter in our Bibles. And I've given you seven words to navigate our time through this chapter. Afflictions, home, goal, motivation, people, business, and message. Those are our guideposts for walking through this chapter. And we find ourselves this morning in part four, motivation. We want to see our motivation for life through the eyes of heaven. We've learned so far that through the eyes of heaven, afflictions are light and momentary. We've learned seeing with an eternal perspective that heaven is home, and we've learned that our goal, if we see it through heaven's eyes, is to please Christ. And here this morning, what we'll find is that our motivation for life, what fuels the Christian life, what drives the Christian life, compels the Christian life, is the twofold motivation of fear and love. Fear of the Lord and love of Christ. And that's what we'll be looking at this morning. It was June 3rd, 2017, when rock climber Alex Honnold climbed El Capitan in Yosemite. And he climbed it alone, and he climbed it without ropes in under four hours. That's 2,900 feet on sheer granite. I believe that is one of the greatest athletic achievements of all time. And you might immediately be thinking to yourself of other athletic accomplishments that warrant the, the title best ever. But I would tell you that Michael Jordan shooting free throws with his eyes closed wouldn't cost him his life if he missed. Hank Aaron's home run records um, weren't mortally dangerous. But Alex Honnold, with move after move after move for 2,900 feet, every one of them after the first 10 or so would be lethal if he missed a schmear with his foot or a handhold with his fingertips. A remarkable achievement. Some would say crazy. Herbert Nietzsche is a, sort of a swimmer. I don't know if this counts as swimming. He's a free diver. He holds the record as the world's deepest man. In 2007, he swam 702 feet deep. That's deeper than many submarines are able to go. Only four people in the world have swum deeper than 560 feet without any sort of contained oxygen. This is free diving. Hold your breath for nine minutes and 33 seconds and see how deep you can go. Of the four people that have gone deeper than 560, two of them died trying. And he went to 702 feet. Luke Akins, in July of 2016, jumped... 25,000 feet out of an airplane without a parachute. He successfully jumped with a parachute some 18,000 times, but he decided on this day to jump out of an airplane without a parachute and land in a 100 by 100 foot net. And you're thinking to yourself, why? <laughs> what would drive Alex Honnell? What would drive Herbert Nietzsche? And what would drive Luke Akins? To do such crazy things. You and I, normal people, look at these feats and we say, well, that's just dumb. Why, why, would, any do, why would anybody do such things? What, what would compel someone to take on such achievements? Are they crazy? Something internal, something invisible to the rest of us compelled these athletes, drove them to hone their skills, discipline their minds, train their bodies. They were possessed by something we can't see and don't understand. I want to ask you this morning, what should motivate the Christian life? What should motivate your life 
this morning, Christian. And, and perhaps we should ask ourselves, what is the Christian life? And you might think, well, yeah, loving Jesus, uh, forgiveness, rest, the, the promise of eternal life, peace with God, blessings from God. Yes, all of that is true. But what also characterizes the Christian life is constant, vigilant fight against internal corruptions and diligence, hardship, endurance, persecutions, suffering among enemies. What is the Christian life? Taking up your cross to follow a despised and ridiculed Messiah. The Christian life is leaving houses and brothers and sisters and father and mother and children and farms. It means going without. We got the list from Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 of the kinds of sufferings he faced. He was beaten, imprisoned, in many labors, often in danger of death. Five times he received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times beaten with rods. Once he was stoned, three times shipwrecked, a night and a day he spent in the deep. On frequent journeys and dangers from rivers and robbers, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers from his countrymen, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren, labor and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And Paul said, apart from these external things, there is the daily pressure on him for all the churches. He felt weak when believers were weak. When believers were led into sin, he experienced intense concern. Who would live like this? What could motivate someone to live such a life? Why not just get forgiveness of sin and get comfortable? I want to read our text for this morning, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 to 15. Here's Paul's twin motivation. Therefore, he writes... Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Paul here, in defense of his own apostolic ministry, reveals two compulsions, twin motivations that drove his ministry. And these motivations were internal to him, invisible to the outside, quite apart from appearances. These two motivations fueled Paul's relentless drive to know Christ and to make him known for the short duration of his stay on this earth. And these motivations are not to be unique to the apostle. These ought to motivate every Christian. And if we see our lives with an eternal perspective, with the eyes of heaven, if we see our existence the way eternity would view it, I believe we will be compelled by these same two motivations. The first is found in verses 11 to 13, and it is simply this, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord drove the Apostle Paul. He begins verse 11 by saying, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. And the therefore takes us back to where we were last time in verse 10, that Bema seat judgment of Christ. That is the reward judgment for believers, where that which was worthless gets burned away, and that which the Lord produced by the power of his spirit is rewarded for his glory and our good. Motives are revealed and rewarded. Secrets are disclosed. And that leads to a right perspective of the Lord. This, what Paul calls, fear of the Lord. Knowing this fear of the Lord, knowing that judgment is coming and assessment is coming, we're motivated to do particular things. In this case, in this text, Paul describes persuading others towards Christ. What is this fear of the Lord? It is to fear God, to tremble before Him, to give attention to Him, 
Notice in your Bibles, when people came into the manifest, radiant presence of God, they were not bored, they did not get distracted, they gave their full attention to him. To fear him means to give full attention to him, to his presence and his being. It means to be in awe of him, to revere him. And the outflowing of the fear of the Lord is to obey him, to love him, to be afraid to sin. It produces a desire to please him. That's what we saw last time in the goal of life being to please Christ. But it also means in fearing the Lord to be attracted to him, to not want to be anywhere else. The fear of the Lord produces a, a magnetic impulse in someone rightly related to God. I want to get close to him. This is terrifying, yes, and it is terribly good. So fear of the Lord means we love him, we revere him, we are not trite with him, we tremble before him, and we want more than anything else to be in his presence. Peter said in Matthew 17 at the transfiguration, you remember Jesus, God in the flesh on top of the mountain, and the heavenly voice of his father saying, this is my son, listen to him, and Jesus is uncloaked for a few moments, and the radiance of his glory leaking out. And Peter, who is usually not short for words, sort of tongue-tied, utters this statement. It's good for us to be here. You remember the scene in Revelation 1 where John sees the glorified Christ unveiled in his glory, a terrifying appearance, and John flat on his face before the Lord. And it makes us all want to be there. Where else would you want to be? This fear of the Lord is some combination of abject terror and irresistible attraction. And Paul says, knowing this fear of the Lord, we persuade men. And do you see the connection there? Paul's desire to win people to Christ is driven by fear of the Lord, by coming judgment, by the glory of God, the pleasure of God, the happiness of God, and the omniscient scrutiny of God. Paul does not seek to win people for his own self-aggrandizement. He's not motivated by what people think of him. He is moved, compelled, motivated, fueled by a fear of God. That attractive, glorious terror before which he trembles. And he says in verse 13, But we are made manifest to God. That is, that God knows the heart. To be made manifest just means to be exposed before, to be known by. And so God knows Paul's heart in this, and, and Paul knows Paul's heart in this, and it's contrary, perhaps, to outward appearances. While God knows that Paul was driven by fear of the Lord rather than, rather than a desire to impress people, this was the Corinthian misunderstanding. They thought that Paul ought to be about impressing people at a horizontal level. And they perhaps thought that he was and wasn't very good at it. This is precisely why Paul was doubted by the Corinthians, why Paul was despised by the Corinthians in his ministry to them. They wanted Paul to impress their carnal sensitivities in the same way that their entertainers impressed them, with the rehearsed skills of presentation. They wanted Paul to be the showman, the salesman, the actor, the rhetorician, they believed that if someone was going to believe a message about Jesus, that message had to be couched in production value, theatrics, the strategies that actually work to get a jury to decide a verdict, or to get a customer to purchase a product, or to get an audience to laugh and to cry at the right times, to be persuaded. I mean, if the message of Jesus is so important... Why wouldn't we want to use the tried and true methods of communication in order to get people to believe it? Paul, however, believed in a message of Christ and the power of the message of Christ unadorned. Paul knew furthermore that to depend on gimmicks of human contrivance to make the gospel understood would actually undermine the gospel itself. You can't get the message right if you mess up the method that God has ordained for that message. You see, gospel proclamation is the job of a herald, not an actor, not a salesman. 
Gospel belief is a matter of new birth, of supernatural power by the Holy Spirit. How do heralds bring about new birth? Well, God by his Holy Spirit has to make a man born again. He must be born from above. What is the herald's task? Simply to get the message right. And God is pleased to bring people to new life through a faithfully heralded message. If someone could be entertained into belief in Jesus, then they can be entertained out of belief in Jesus. But if you are born from above by the power of God, nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. This is why Paul spent the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians exposing the Corinthian temptation to look at outward appearances. They were in danger of stripping the power from the very message that saved them. And here in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul is still appealing to those beloved believers that they would see with the eyes of heaven and not give in to outward appearances. That is particularly what motivated Paul's relentless life of suffering. The glory of God, the fear of the Lord, that internal drive to not worry about what other people think. He was not motivated, as the Corinthians had supposed, by love of money, by secret sin, or a longing for fame. He was motivated by fear of the Lord and the soon arriving assessment of the one who sees the heart and rewards what is done for his glory. The Corinthians considered Paul to be weak, unimpressive, not entertaining, dull, with no credentials and no mystical experiences. He could not compare by their evaluation to the tricksters and the hucksters and the entertainers of their day. So verse 11 is this gentle indictment of their perspective. Look what he says there. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we're manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also to your consciences. What does Paul want them to know? What does he want them to own? The same conviction that he has, the same conviction by which he operates. He wants them to know that he's not living for their entertainment. He's not operating for them to be impressed. You should know what drives me, says Paul. I hope you see it. Notice verse 12. He says, we're not again commending ourselves to you, but we are giving an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. This is a remarkable window into Paul's heart here. Paul defending his own motives is not really about him. We're so easily tempted to defend our own motives because we want people to think more highly of us and not get the wrong ideas. We typically set out to defend our motives when our outward behavior seems contrary to good motives, and we want people to think better of us than our actions recommend. But Paul here in verse 12 is others-focused. He's not so concerned that he himself would be maligned, but he wants to give the Corinthians, what he says here, an occasion to be proud, literally the opportunity of boasting. Boasting in what? What does he want them to be proud about? The unadulterated, unadorned proclamation of the gospel that has been the hallmark of the Apostle Paul's life and ministry. If they are to understand what he's really driven by, then they're not going to be tempted when the next entertainer comes to town and impresses them with flashy words and all the tricks. They will know what it was like to listen to the Apostle Paul and a plain message about Christ because that is where the power is. And when people say, no, follow me, I've got a better presentation. We've got laser lights and smoke machines or whatever it is they had in their day. They will know that is not where the power is. That's what Paul wants them to have confidence in. So that, notice Paul says, you will have an answer for those who take pride, notice this, in appearance and not in heart. They needed to have an answer, a ready answer for those who were merely looking at externals. So Paul is looking out for these beloved Christians here, equipping them to have this ready answer when entertainers come along and try to convince them that what they really need to get their message out is the next slick marketing campaign, some compelling show, or an attractive spokesperson. They can boast instead in the power of the gospel itself, proclaimed by an unimpressive spokesman who simply believe in the gospel's power. And listen, Christian, 
this principle is so liberating. You don't need to be the powerful, the popular, the the personable. You don't need to have the magnetic, attractive personality for God to work through you in heralding the gospel. You simply need to believe the gospel and speak it. The power is in the gospel itself. We don't need the, the latest, best, crazy way to do effective evangelism. You just need to tell the world about your Savior. And this is so liberating because the power is not in us. The power is not in the Apostle Paul. And the Corinthian believers didn't need to believe that the power was in the next great speaker who could whoosh into town and give the message the ring it needed. The gospel needs no flashy contraptions, no accoutrements. Verse 13 rounds out this first motivation. Look what Paul says there. For if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Notice here Paul's concern about impressions. It's okay if people thought Paul was crazy. Paul was crazy for God's sake. That's all right. But there is a sound-mindedness for the sake of believers. The world could look at Paul and say, Paul, are you crazy? Are you a little off your rocker? Are you like climbing El Capitan without ropes? No, he was motivated by fear of God. Love, obedience, reverence, awe. And this kills fear of man. If you rightly fear the biggest and the strongest, and the biggest and the strongest loves you, has set his affections on you, has eternal purposes on your life, then you have nothing else to fear. And Paul's life might look crazy. It might look uncomfortable. It might be undesirable to worldly-minded people, to even temporal-minded Christians, to people who are committed to having their best life now. But Paul's not crazy. He's not crazy at all, because when you view your life the way heaven views your life, remember that infinite ball of twine and the little sliver of it at the end that is your earthly life. When you measure your life against eternity, it's not crazy at all to live like Paul. His fervent, relentless drive to know Christ and to make Christ known, whatever the cost, is the most sane perspective one could have. And so he says in verse 13, for your sake, we are of sound mind. That is straightforward, sober-minded seriousness. Paul's willing to appear crazy for God's sake. But his eternally rational perspective is for the benefit of the Corinthian Christians. And this is a model of how to live. And Paul was in good company. We would be in good company imitating Paul in this. The disciples in Acts 16 were thrown into prison and uh, fastened their feet in the stocks. What did did the disciples do when they were persecuted for Christ? Sang in jail. Paul was accused of going mad for his belief in the resurrection. It was said of Jesus Christ that he has lost his senses. In Matthew 11, John the Baptist uh, was said to have a demon and, and the Son of Man was said to be gluttonous and a drunkard. You'd be in good company with the Apostle Paul and John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ if the world around us thinks us to be crazy for the way that we live. A God-driven life is crazy to the world. Think about your own life this morning. If you live for Christ, if you were to step out of this building and and live for him in the ways that you know he is worthy, will your environments consider you crazy? Maybe your own household, maybe your workplace, maybe your sports team, maybe the classroom. I would hope that those who don't know Christ would consider us to be a little strange. We ought to be. Is it possible that we become so accustomed to a temporal perspective, so comfortable with the perishing world around us, so captivated perhaps by wanting to be liked, that we start to blend in with the perishing world? There are some motivations contrary to fear of the Lord that can drive us. 
Maybe we want a little rest from being considered crazy. It's just hard to stick out like a sore thumb all the time. Maybe we start to believe that if we are just a little bit like them, they might start to think that the gospel that we believe is okay. If we sort of mainstream Christian living so that it's comfortable for the world around us, they'll say, oh yeah, following Christ must be all right and must not be that uncomfortable because they're doing it and they're just like me. That is a deception that undermines the gospel, which absolutely transforms a life. Friends, if the salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? To be useful in this world, we must be captivated by, motivated by the fear of the Lord. There's a second motivation here that drove the Apostle Paul and ought to drive us. It is the love of Christ. Look down at verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ controls us, Paul writes. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Paul speaks of the love of Christ controlling us, that is, to to hold within bounds so as to manage, guide, direct, or control. It also has the idea of compulsion, of being a driving force. So the love of Christ hems us in, keeps us in bounds, directs, and motivates the Christian life. This love of Christ, what is this? This grammatically could be our love for him, or it could be his love for us. Both of those are are possible grammatically, but I believe Christ's love for us makes more sense in this context. Notice where Paul goes with this in verse 14, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died with this purpose that we would no longer live to ourselves. Christ's activity at the cross, uh, his love for us in sacrificing himself on our behalf is what is in view. And we know that in Christ loving us, that produces a love for him uh, in return. When God initiates, we love him because he first loved us. All of our love for God could only spring from God's love for us, which springs from God's love for God and his own glory and his desire to put on display love towards the unlovely. This all begins in him. What does it mean then that the love of Christ controls us? You may have been bowling, and and if you're a A bowler like me, you've recognized the need from time to time for that little button, that switch that pushes up the gutter rails. Do you use the gutter rails? I find those to be really helpful. The the likelihood of getting skunked at the end of the lane and not hitting any pins goes way down with the gutter rails, although I have demonstrated that it is still possible to not hit any pins with the gutter rails up. This love of Christ hems us in like gutter rails are designed to hem in a bowling ball down the track. But more than that, this love of Christ drives us. It it motivates us. It compels us. Not only does it keep us from going out of bounds, but it, it gets us moving where we need to go. This is what Paul relates in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, and listen to this, who loved me and gave himself up for me. This love of Christ for sinners drives the Christian life. And it drives the Christian life, excuse me, in the direction it must go. And it motivates precisely because it's connected to the reason for which Christ died in this text. Notice verse 14, Paul says, The love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all so that they would not live for themselves. All of Paul's argument here culminates in a so that, a purpose or result statement. And by the way, when God is in charge, he gets what he wants, so purpose and result overlap significantly here. 
You can aim at something but not get it. You can do something and have a result that you may or may not have intended. But when God purposes, he gets his intended results. That's what's in view here. Let's look at Paul's argument and we'll build up to that purpose statement. Notice he says in verse 14, having concluded this. That means having come to an accurate judgment. Having come to the appropriate assessment. And notice what Paul says. What is this accurate assessment? What is this conclusion arrived at by right judgment? That one died for all. That one died for all. Here we're talking about the language of substitution. That one died in the place of all. And you must think about the the guilty standing in the place of execution... You might think of a firing squad with a number of men with rifles aiming at the one to be executed. And a substitute is one who stands in the breach, stands in the way, stands in between, and takes the bullets aimed at the one lined up for execution. The substitute stands in the place of the guilty. When the statement says that one died for all, it simply means that Jesus Christ, the righteous, the just, the perfect, died in the place of all. And who are these all? We always have to pay attention to context. I'll give you a few definitions of of the word all, and you can trace these throughout your Bible. There is the use of the word all, which means all without exception. That means every single kind of thing Uh, considerable and every individual in all of those categories. There is, of course, the all without distinction, meaning all sorts or all kinds. And, And then there is the all that is often used in your Bible that is all in this context. In other words, everyone described in this context, all the ones that I'm talking about right here. And that clearly is the use of all in this context. That Christ died for all, therefore all died. Who are the all in verse 14 that died? Uh, We'll see as we unpack this, these are believers. This having died is a statement only true of Christians who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. The all in the last clause of verse 14 is the same as the all in the second to last clause of verse 14. And then that's unfolded in the verse 15, he died for all so that they who live. In other words, the the same ones who died are now the ones who now live, and they are the same ones for whom Christ died in verse 14, or verse 15, and they are the same all in verse 14 in both instances. To stay consistent with the context, the all here for whom Christ died are the same all that now live and the same all for whom Christ died. Christ laid down his life so that they would not live for themselves, but live for him. This is what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. Paul died. Paul died on the day that he was born again. And, and that's the reality of new birth. New birth brings about a death. It brings about a death of the paleos anthropos, the old man, Uh, later in this chapter, and we'll get to this in the coming weeks. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Things have been left behind. Things are killed. Things are killed off and left dead, never to be revisited again. If you are in Christ, the old you no longer exists, and there is a new you. A new you with new affections, new desires, new power, the indwelling Holy Spirit. An entirely new direction and flavor of life. This is what Paul articulates in Romans chapter 6. We died with reference to sin. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been buried with him through baptism into death? And he goes on in Romans 6 to describe the new life in Christ as a resurrection life now in the power of Christ. And what an interesting thing the Bible does with this imagery of of death and life. We heard it already this morning. You were walking in your transgressions and sins. 
you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That's an interesting metaphor. You were walking around in a death. How do dead men walk? Well, spiritually dead men walk around in transgressions and sins. And to become new in Christ is to be raised from spiritual death unto spiritual life, to be given eternal life once and forever at new birth, an an eternal life that transcends your physical mortality here. So that every Christian can say full-throated, I died with Christ and I now live. That is the Bible's picture of life and death. It is why Jesus can say in John 11, anyone who believes in me will never die. And everyone who believes in me will live even if he dies. Both of those are true. Because Christian, you will still face your physical mortality, but you possess eternal life as a river of life welling up inside you that will never go away. So for Paul to say, I have been crucified with Christ, for him to say to Christians, do you not know that we have died to sin? For him to say, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Simply a reflection of this we might call thanatology. Thanos for death and a study of it in the New Testament. That Jesus died for all, therefore all died. All in Christ die so that they may live. And notice this so that here, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. This is sort of the ultimate ought. If that substitute stood in your place between you and a a line of soldiers with rifles aimed at your head for your rightful just execution, and he stood in your place and took what you deserved so that you go free, what would your affections for him be? How much would you love him? And listen, Christian, this is not simply an ought, like it would be appropriate for you to have affections for the one who was substituted for you, but Christ, in making you a new creature, pours out his love, Romans 5, in your heart by the Holy Spirit whom he has given, so that you do love him. This is not just an ought, friends, this is a reality for a Christian. A Christian loves Jesus. We are compelled by the love of Christ for us. It overflows in our lives in love for him. And it produces a life that is not lived for self. Because that's contrary to the very purpose for which Christ died. Christ died for me so that I would live unto him. And what love is this? Could you imagine if Christ left you unchanged? Yeah, forgive your sin, but keep living with the same categories, powers, abilities that you had before. How miserable would that be? He doesn't leave you like you were. He actually produces a life that abandons your old self. It means he doesn't leave you to live for self anymore. And if he did, what a tragedy that would be. You knew what it was like to live wholly and entirely for yourself. You live now with the residue of it, and it's a constant battle. But in your best moments, you know, living for myself is so dumb. I'm finite, I'm puny, I'm fallible, I make mistakes, and what is there to live for in me anyway? I get Christ. I get to live for Him by his power and for his glory, and I get him. What a trade. What a love of God to not leave us to ourselves and our own capacities and our own dead ends. We see the love of God in Christ for us in loving the unlovely. We see the love of God in Christ through substitutionary atonement. And we see the love of God in Christ for me to pay for my sins, reconcile me to himself, to make me his own, and to rescue me from myself and the dead end that that is. If you abandon living for self and you live for God, unto God, by God, you will never be disappointed. 
with all of God's love for us in Christ, how could we live otherwise than for him? The love of Christ is a powerful, powerful argument to live for him. It's a compelling motivation to think regularly, deeply, thoroughly about what it means that Jesus died for you personally, Christian, in your place as your substitute because he loved you when you were at your worst, when you were helpless and hopeless and dead, when you had made yourself an enemy of your maker, he loved you. And to experience such love, to be brought into belonging with the perfect one that we had made our enemy, to experience such love moves the Christian to live for him. What a powerful motivator. The Corinthian believers needed to know what drove Paul. Fear of the love, fear of the Lord, and love of Christ. Christian, have you forgotten? You hear this morning, have you forgotten the love of God in Christ for you? This is one of the reasons we gather. This is one of the reasons we sing the songs that we sing. This is one of the reasons we talk to each other and encourage each other throughout the week. So that we do not forget the love of God, the rescue of God. We need this to motivate the Christian life. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're on the fence about whether to live for yourself or to live unto God, Maybe you fear losing something by surrendering to Christ. Perhaps you fear that something might die, some relationship, some love, some distraction, some opportunity, some darling sin that you want desperately to hold on to, and, and that might just have to die if you were to surrender to Christ. Well, let me encourage you. If you surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will lose things. <laughs> And things will die, but nothing worth holding on to. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Nothing. Nobody could properly value the worth of an eternal soul. We can't do the math right on that. We don't have numbers to compute infinite things. And when we're talking about leaving worthless trifles in order to have Christ, we're talking about far more than the value of preserving your own soul. We're talking about the infinite value of the exchange of trash and trinkets for the infinite treasure, the surpassing value, Paul says, of what it is to know Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. Gladly. Living for self is a slavery leading to death. Living for Christ is glorious freedom and eternal life. And there is nothing worth holding on to if it means rejecting the infinite goodness found only in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good. You do good. And we are not good. We deserve nothing but your fury, the just right fury of your wrath against sinners who sin. And yet you have been so kind not only to save and to forgive at the infinite cost of your own Son, but you've been kind also to transform, to not leave us to ourselves, to our own resources, to not leave us living for self, but to motivate us by our love, to live for you, to motivate us by your awesome beauty, to fear you rightly. And you've not just given these as external motivations, but you've put them in the hearts of those who love you by the power of your Holy Spirit, transforming and, and giving power to fear you and to love Christ because he has first loved us. Lord, may we go from here as trophies of your love, trophies of your grace, speaking as heralds of your truth as long as you give us breath in this short life. We ask it in Jesus' name.